Howdy. Nice wooded path here. Let's go see what we can find. It's only the first week of April, and so not much has really gotten going as far as sprouting. And this is a great time to look for some of the amphibians that have woken up early. Okay, I admit this is a herp quest, not fungus quest, but this might be one of the biggest I've ever seen. Awesome. Ooh. Hmm. Herp quest, not mollusk quest, but... Oh. Vacancy. Oh, you see what I see? There's one of our first spring toads. Most likely because of where I'm at, this is a Eastern American toad. Hey dude, how's it going? Let's check him out, get a closer look. Ooh. To be honest, I was about to go home. I thought I was just taking an L on this one, but uh, American toad, Eastern American toad, pretty common, but there are some things about it that make it kind of tough to identify between this toad and some of the other ones that are out there. Well, one thing that is true of the American toad is that the belly does have spots, whereas also in Michigan Fowler's toad, the belly is clear of spots. Let's go get to a less windy spot to talk about it. All right. If I was making this video a few years ago, then we would call this Bufo Americanus. But since then, there's been some new taxonomical rearrangement, and now Anaxerus Americanus is what more and more herpetologists are preferring to call the taxonomy of this species the Eastern American toad. This is North America's most widespread toad. It ranges through southeastern Canada. It goes as far west as almost to the Rockies. You've got Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, anywhere definitely near the Mississippi River, and then everywhere east of there other than it only goes about as south as Georgia. The breeding season officially starts around March, but it depends upon what the temperatures are, and that also depends certainly upon what location we're finding it northern latitudes it starts a little bit later but they will breed anywhere from march to july depending upon the region depending upon the temperatures and the voice is definitely a distinct trill kind of call and it can last anywhere from just five seconds to 30 seconds and also the speed of this like many frogs and toads depends upon what the temperatures are here give a listen Recognize subspecies of this species is either two or three, again, depending upon who you talk to. You've got the Eastern American toad, the Dwarf American toad, and also the sometimes not as often recognized Hudson Bay toad. They're mostly nocturnal, though you can find them certainly in the day doing their thing, and they are a voracious eater of insects, making them a pretty good benefit to just about any garden. In fact, unlike many of the amphibian species that I've been doing episodes about, this is one where its population is pretty stable. Human encroachment on its territory hasn't led to any severe declines in the American toad, but instead it seems to be able to cohabitate in our yards pretty well. Now that's not to say that there can't be a disaster to happen to a local population if, for example, certain wetlands are developed and dried up. That doesn't give it any place to lay its eggs, any place for the tadpoles to grow up and become adults. But this species will take prime advantage of even just temporary pools of water in the early spring before summer ends up drying them up. And these females can also lay a tremendous number of eggs, anywhere from 2,000 to 20,000. Those eggs will hatch anywhere between 4 and 10 days, again, depending upon temperature. And those tadpoles take anywhere between 30 to 60 days to become juvenile adults, also known as toadlets. An adult can live anywhere between five to eight years out there in the wild, but in captivity, there's actually on record a female that has lived past 30 years. Now, I'm here in Michigan, and when it comes to where I live, we've only got two toads. The Eastern American toad, but then also Fowler's toad. 
And for those two, that's actually pretty easy to identify. Up by the head, both have paratoid glands. For the Eastern American toad, that paratoid gland is pretty long, and that's true for the Fowler toad as well. However, notice right here these two ridges. These are called cranial crests, and they're right here between the eyes. Well, on the Eastern American toad, those cranial crests, according to what resources I've looked at, they say that they will never be touching the paratoid glands. However, for the Fowler's toad, these cranial crests do come into contact with the paratoid glands. If it's really threatened, if something's trying to eat it, you can have some very nauseous fluids pump out of the paratoid glands. This makes it pretty foul tasting to any predator that might try to eat it, and hopefully it recognizes just how foul that is before it does any real damage to the toad. A lot of times these toads might get picked up and very quickly spat out. And even before that happens, these guys drink a whole lot of water, so if you happen to pick them up, well, they tend to urinate. And that's the first line of defense in case something wants to eat them. Another good identifying feature is the dorsal line that a lot of the Eastern American toads have. It could be very prominent, or it could just be barely there, kind of like this specimen we found here. But as not every toad has it, it's a good way to tell if you have an Eastern American toad. But furthermore, a really interesting thing about this species is that the tadpoles themselves produce their own toxins. When it comes to the toxins the tadpoles produce, they are potent enough to sometimes kill the fish that eats them. In other cases, though, it just may be a lesson that the fish learns, let's not eat another one because of just how bad that was. And while that doesn't really help out the tadpole that just got eaten, it does teach the fish in that local pond area to stay away from these little black tadpoles. There's a community benefit, in other words, to having this evolutionary advantage. One more really awesome factoid about this guy, and then we'll go let him go. The Eastern American toad tends to prefer the same location. Once it's found a good food and water source, it doesn't really travel too far. This can lead some of the ones that developed in a certain pond area to stick around there. And that means many brothers and sisters might be in the same area. Needless to say, they might return to that wetland to do breeding. And so how do they really avoid incest? Well, this is still being studied, and the current leading evidence suggests that the male trill has slight variations to it, just enough to indicate what genetic line it's coming from. The sisters, the females, are able to pick up on this and can actually recognize if that's a brother or not, and thus avoid breeding. That's awesome. Okay, back to the trail we go. Gonna let this guy go right back where we found him. I'm Rich Lund. Thank you for coming on this herp quest with me. And let's remember, if you go out there into nature, let's leave it as good or better than we found it. See you next time.